Now, the recent global crisis has had a very profound effect on our international monetary and financial organizations and institutions. Uh, prior to the crisis, the IMF was just a bait out of business. Uh, they were cutting back staff, they were making few new loans, uh, they were really in the doldrums. Uh, the crisis has given them a new lease on life. Okay, now, I don't think they caused the crisis, but it's been, uh, from a bureaucratic perspective, it has been incredibly uh, useful because they have come back and are probably in the strongest position of influence on the global economy that they've been, uh, perhaps ever and certainly in quite a long time. Uh, probably even more important than that uh, was the evolution of the G20 into a major, uh, not so much decision-making body, but at least discussion group. Uh, it had been in existence since the Asian crisis, but the big uh, change is essentially the G7 or G8 was expanded to be the G20. And so that has become the primary talking shop of the heads of state and finance ministers. Um, a few people have been critical of this because you still have many countries left out of the G20. There was an article in Financial Times about a week ago about what about the G172, the other countries who are in the UN and aren't in the G20, okay? And had a nice proposal for how we would have more representative uh, uh, of a new sort of council for economic cooperation or coordination, uh, which I would favor, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, the G20 is now where the action is. Uh, and I think compared, if you view it as the substitute for the G7 or G8, that's an enormous advance in terms of having more participation and more views in the world uh, economy. So I tend to stress the positive of the G20. Uh, and the questions are how effective will it be? Um, in the early stages, I think it was extremely effective. Uh, we got through the early and mid stages of the crisis without any substantial economic warfare or collapse. Um, a lot of people were seriously concerned we would have a repeat of the economic warfare in the, in the Great Depression. And in terms of the magnitude of the shock of the system, it was sort of comparable. So uh, this was a very real concern. Uh, basically had very little competitive depreciation or competitive devaluation, which was the big beggar the neighbor policy of the 1930s. Uh, also, uh, a tremendous success in countries adopting a little bit coordinated stimulative monetary and fiscal policies, which limited the disastrous effects of the crisis. Didn't eliminate them by any means, but most of the sort of estimates from econometric models and all would be if, if we hadn't had the various stimulus packages, uh, unemployment would be far higher than it is, growth much lower and all. Uh, it's sort of hard for us to appreciate in the U.S. with the unemployment rate still so high, but I think there's, and you sometimes get people saying, that shows the stimulus didn't work. Well, that's just not right. Uh, a lot of disagreement among the different models of just how much it helped things from getting worse than they are, but any of the respectable uh, economic studies suggest that it had a substantial positive uh, impact. So in the early stages, 
uh, the G20 was, I think, enormously successful. And also in the mid-state stage of laying out a good qualitative framework of things that needed to be done to rebalance the global economy. Because we really had two interconnected sets of problems. One was the financial crisis itself. The other was the very substantial global economic imbalances. Uh, in shorthand, think of sort of trade deficits and surpluses or current account deficits and surpluses, where you had countries like the United States and Greece in huge deficits, and countries like Germany and China and uh, some of the Arab countries in huge surpluses. Uh, these were not likely to be sustainable. And some of our mainstream macroeconomic theory on which the vast majority of economists agree uh, suggests that to reduce these imbalances at minimal cost, there's a strong case for policy coordination. Exchange rate changes play a role in that. Uh, there's a lot of misleading controversy, for example, of the role of the renminbi, China's exchange rate, as to how much it's contributing. We, we could talk more later if you're interested in that. But uh, there's been a huge amount of confusion in the sense that a lot of people correctly say uh, revaluation of the renminbi by itself won't solve all the problems. And that's absolutely true. That doesn't mean it couldn't be a substantial help along with other policies. But it, the whole issue has become so politicized that you very often get the impression that one side is saying all we have to do is get China to, to revalue. Uh, and the other side is saying that would be a disaster. Okay. I personally think a uh, substantial revaluation of the renminbi would be a very good idea for China as well as for the U.S. and the world economy. But it's clearly not the only policy that we've got going along with the international or external imbalances. There are corresponding internal imbalances. So countries like Germany and China are not consuming enough domestically. They are relying too much on external demand to generate domestic growth and employment. Okay. And by the same token, U.S. and Greece, just to name two, have been relying way too much on overspending domestically you know, and have been free riding on internationally financially integrated world markets. So we've been living beyond our means. Um, and some other countries have been too frugal. And one of the important key insights of Keynesian economics, which is discredited in some aspects and still very mainstream in some others. So again, you've got to be very careful, you'll, you'll see lots of debates, Keynesianism is discredited or uh, Paul Krugman will say it's shown its value. Um, you really can't do almost anything useful at that level. You have to disaggregate it to different, uh, to different aspects. Uh, the original Keynesian belief in a stable short run Phillips curve or inflation unemployment trade-off has been clearly discredited. On the other hand, uh, the idea that aggregate demand is important and that the private sector doesn't always generate just the right amount uh, has, I think, been very strongly vindicated. And one of the strong implications of Keynesian analysis is uh, what he called the paradox of thrift, that normally we think of savings as good. But if suddenly everybody starts saving at the same time, that can put 
the economy into a recession. Okay. And in part, what we're challenged with now is an international application of that. On top of it, to make the situation even worse, uh, we, there's a big difference between what macroeconomic policy in many countries should be in the short term and the long term. Okay. And I'm making sort of pretty strong assertions, which I'll be glad to talk about in more detail, but what I'm saying is pretty much mainstream uh, economics, that when we're in a recession on a real sluggish economy, we need more economic stimulus. And most economists, not all by any means, but most economists would say in the U.S. today, we're doing not enough fiscal stimulus and having to rely too much on monetary policy. Okay. On the other hand, critics can quite correctly argue, but countries like the U.K. and Greece and the U.S have been fiscally irresponsible for a number of <coughs> years and have huge debt relative to GDP that is going to be a real medium or longer term problem. So a number of political leaders uh, and governments in Germany and a number of other in the UK now have said that is such a problem that we need to start fiscal tightening, even though the economy at the macro level is doing very badly. Okay. Now, the ideal economic solution is really fairly simple. Okay. The details of just how big these sh movements and all should be are quite complicated, but what you should do according to standard macro, is have fiscal stimulus now, but make a credible commitment to reduce deficits in the future. The problem is, politically, how do you do that? And there really isn't. And if anybody has a, has a good uh, answer to how we do that, please tell me and, and tell Washington. Uh, so that we have a real conundrum, what in economics we call a time inconsistency problem. Okay. And one of the lessons from the crisis is it's really dangerous to abuse fiscal stimulus, except when you're in a really bad situation. Because one of the things that Keynes did not focus on, and subsequent analysis does, is if you keep running huge deficits for too long, your credibility gets lost. And so all of mainstream traditional Keynesian economics was based on the assumption that you, the government has credibility, that it hasn't already run such large budget deficits in the past that people are worried about will it default or will it repay so that we have to redo some of the standard Keynesian analysis for countries like the United States and Greece, where we've gotten into that situation. Now, I think the other, some people argue the situation has gotten so bad that fiscal stimulus today in the United States wouldn't have positive effects. I doubt that that's true. Most of the work that I've seen suggests there is still scope in the short run for fiscal expansion to work. But we do very seriously have to worry about the longer run impact. And people who say it's the uncertainty over future government policies in the U.S., in Europe, uh, that's holding back the recovery uh, I think is very, very true. So we have a tremendous government credibility problem in many, many countries. Okay. Now, 
where the international coordination comes in through the G20 and IMF and so forth is uh, that it will be a lot less costly for any of the countries with serious imbalances, whether surpluses or deficits, to make the adjustments if the countries on the other side are adjusting as well. In other words, this is one of the really clear cases where there should be mutual adjustments on both sides. Problem is, politically, uh, these adjustments, well, I think pretty clearly right on aggregate macroeconomic effect, or whether you're in a surplus country or a deficit country, will have various adverse short-run political effects. And that's keeping countries on both the surplus and deficit side from adjusting. Okay. That's the key problem we are, one of the key problems. The other is revising our financial systems, which, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. we used to love to go around preaching to other countries how they needed to have financial liberalization and adopt all of our latest uh, financial market innovations and regulations, well, we blew it badly. Uh, we let our financial system get incredibly out of whack. Okay. And this was largely due to domestic factors in major countries. But the threat of international competition, you know, played a role as well in the de in the excessive deregulation process. And clearly, as we can see, uh, financial crises in one country can have very substantial effects on others. Uh, many of the emerging markets got clobbered by what was going on in the U.S. and Europe uh, in a very unf you know, unfair way. So they have a, one of the implications is that emerging markets in developing countries have got a very legitimate interest in the financial policies in the advanced economies. So one of the big favorable developments from an organizational standpoint, then, is the expansion of the G7, G8 to the G20. And going along with that, the expansion of the Financial Stability Forum, which is where the regulators uh, and financial leaders get together, uh, to, was converted into a Financial Stability Board, and its membership greatly expanded, you know, in line with the move to the G20. So from a standpoint of global governance, that was a tremendously important uh, development. And going along with this too, we might say there just was agreement at uh, the, la the latest uh, preparation meeting for the G20 meeting in Seoul next month that uh, there'll be about a 6% shift in quotas from the advanced economies to emerging and developing countries. And after many negotiations with the U.S., uh, the European Union has agreed to give up two of its seats on the board. Symbolically, that's very important. Substantively, it makes almost no difference because the voting structure in the IMF very seldom matters. Uh, I was in Beijing a month ago, and we were talking about a lot of these issues, and it, it was very interesting, the emphasis of a number of the Chinese officials, uh, which I think was very well taken, was to see an expansion of the IMF management with more deputy managing directors 
from emerging market countries. And if that occurred, or, I mean, obviously they were thinking there should be a Chinese, this is the next managing director. Um, and there is, in principle, an agreement that the managing director no longer needs to come from Europe. Uh, and there are many, many capable people in emerging market countries. But even if they did not get the next managing director to expand the number of deputy managing directors in a way that they had had some influence, probably makes a whole lot more difference. So that'll be interesting to watch and see. Uh, it's clear now the big emerging market countries have an opportunity to have their voice heard much more than in the past. Of course, for that to work very well, the traditional hierarchy has got to pay attention to them. And in recent months, uh, a lot of pessimism has crept in to discussions of the G20. Uh, agreements made in principle at the Pittsburgh meetings don't show much evidence of being carried out very much. The sort of progress tends to be fairly slow. Uh, a number of the emerging market economies said that basically the whole G20 exercise got sabotaged into a debate between the U.S. and China over the renminbi and uh, the bilateral trade balance. And some of them got so disgusted that the uh, finance minister from Brazil, the gentleman who announced that we were in a currency war, uh, didn't even come to the last meeting. And you hear comments from India for example, of being very discouraged at the progress being made. On the other hand, uh, at the last prefatory meeting last week, there was actually uh, more progress made, apparently, than a lot of people expected. And there was a, forgot to bring it, but there was a headline in the Financial Times today that China is warming to some of the G20 objectives. So it's clearly too early to say the G20 has failed. Okay. Uh, it's clearly failed in terms of the highfalutin rhetoric that a lot of officials have made in the past. But we just have to forgive them. They can't help themselves. You know, when they get a platform, this is the greatest meeting ever, or we'll do this or that, uh, they'll never succeed judged against those expectations. But if we take realistic expectations, uh, there has been a lot of progress. But we're still in a not terribly good situation. As I said, we've pretty much avoided competitive depreciations or devaluations. But the modern analog to that, which is not as bad or as serious, but is serious, is what Tim Geithner, our Treasury Secretary, calls uh, uh, competitive non-appreciations. Country, many countries are fighting very hard against appreciation. Okay. Uh, and that's a real problem, and it's very hard to deal with. Because the international community, including the International Monetary Fund, really doesn't have any instruments to deal with this other than moral suasion and cooperation, you know, which is a fairly weak read to lie on, rely on, but it's probably the only thing that we have. So in this sense, uh, there are a lot of useful developments about the way IMF will do surveillance and things like that. If you ask me as a realist, are they going to make a big difference? I'll probably say no. If you ask me as my real idealist self, I'll say 
at least they're improvements. They may not work, but they have a chance. And let's, let's give them a chance uh, to do it. On cooperation on the financial sector, we've also got the same very mixed scorecard. Uh, some very substantial improvement. Uh, and some, uh, in many areas, a lack of moving forward. That's probably not a huge problem right now. Uh, we're in this, you're not going to get overlending within the advanced economies right now. So you've got time to get it r right or less bad. So the, I think it was very wise, like just a few weeks ago, the, uh, some of the regulators said they would not have ready proposals for the next G20 meeting. That didn't bother me a bit. Uh, I'd rather have them spend more time and be more likely to get it right. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, in a lot of the right words are coming out of the Financial Stability Board. Uh, that we need to focus much more on macro prudential regulation. Uh, if you're interested, we can talk later what that, what that uh, means. That government should reduce the amount of regulations they have that say people have to rely on the ratings agencies that played a big role in the crisis. Uh, a number of very good things like that are occurring. Uh, and the so-called Basel III uh, is increasing uh, capital requirements for the major banks, which is definitely a move in the right direction. Probably didn't go far enough, but is a move in the right direction. On the other hand, uh, there's been a reluctance of the Basel regulators to admit how much they were at fault for this crisis. Uh, I think they had a huge amount of responsibility. Now, if, if we look at discussions of what caused the crisis, <coughs> if you're on the left, you say it was deregulation. If you're on the right, you say it was government intervention with Fannie Mae and stuff like that. Uh, It's really hard to have a sensible discussion of the causes of the crisis at the political level because people have acts to grind. Uh, I'm going to talk, the rest of my talk is going to be on a focus on the importance of what I call mental models or ideas or theories or views of the world. Okay. In a lot of my work, uh, I argue that these can be very, very important and often can have an independent influence on what happens. Okay. If you're from the realist tradition in international relations, you don't like that. The tradition is ideas are just a mask for interest. And there's an awful lot of truth in that. If you changed it from always, to sometimes or often. When you look at uh, former Secretary Paulson saying it was really the Chinese and global uh, savings glut that caused the crisis, that's very clear he was defending his position. Or we hear Alan Greenspan say that. That's a very clear case where they grabbed on a convenient theory to defend themselves. And so we do see a lot of that. On the other hand, uh, mental models have got to be important. Because how do we know our interest? Except through some view of the world. Now, a lot of times it seems so obvious. 
who gains and who loses. That we've all got the same mental model. And so it goes into the background and you know drops out. But the kind of things I've been studying in monetary financial macro policy are areas where it's not so obvious what the correct view is. And where, given different mental models of theories, people's interests can vary quite substantially. And in those areas, uh, I think differences in mental models or which mental model you adopt can make a huge difference. And in my paper, uh, what I talk about are some examples of how defective or wrong or deficient mental model played a very big role in the generation of the crisis. And they weren't the only thing. Uh, now you might ask, how can I make a pronouncement like that when on the other hand, Howard Davies the director of the London School of Economics, the former top British regulator, argued recently, fully three years after the crisis began, we are still no nearer to a consensus about the underlying causes of the crisis. And as I said, if, if you look at Republican Democratic political discussions or German uh, versus French, you see the same amount of disagreement. Or even in academia, uh, I'll give just a couple of examples. Uh, Paul Krugman had a fascinating but highly misleading piece in the New York Times called, How Did Economists Get It So Wrong? Uh, he says, as I see it, the economics profession went astray because economists as a group mistook beauty declared in impressive-looking mathematics for truth. The belief in efficient financial markets blinded many, if not most, economists to the emergence of the biggest financial bubble in history. Economics as a field got in trouble because economists were seduced by a vision of a perfect, frictionless market economy. That from one of our top economist and Nobel laureate. Uh, on the other hand, one of the leaders of the Chicago School, John Cochran, uh, had a delightful, nasty piece on the blog called, How Did Paul Krugman Get It? So, uh, he argued, Paul Krugman has no interesting idea whatsoever about what caused our current financial and economic problems what policies might have prevented it, or what might help us in the future. And he has no contact with people who do. <laughs> Pretty nasty. Uh, now, in, I talk in my paper that of those quotes I gave you, both have some truth. And both have some very misleading aspects to them. Uh, Krugman's truth that sort of the efficient market paradigm and concern with uh, beautiful mathematical models has had too much influence on the ac academic economy is, I think, in my judgment, absolutely true. On the other hand, uh, Many economists did predict the crisis and try to give one, including economists at the IMF and the Bank for International Settlement. Uh, there was a problem that most academic economists over-specialized. Most of the economists, if they've been given the facts, would have said, whoa, we're in trouble. Uh, these arguments you hear from the risk managers at the big banks that this is a 25 sigma event that nobody could have seen are just absolutely wrong. Uh, Coleman Reinhardt and Ken Rogo have a wonderful book called This Time It's Different. Uh, 
which is uh, playing off the phrase, they're the four most dangerous words in the English language, in which every financial bubble has had an element to that where people say the old rules don't apply. And Ken uh, uh, and Coleman, I think, show quite convincingly that if you had been looking at traditional indicators like credit growth and things like that, this crisis was quite predictable. On the other hand, if you use the modern, very sophisticated mathematical tools of risk management that had been enshrined by the Basel group, you wouldn't have predicted it. Because even though they were incredibly sophisticated in some ways, they were incredibly simple. They were basically based on the assumption next year is going to be like last year. And if you had looked at the history of financial booms and collapses, you know that a lot of the traditional signals, if you're looking at market prices, you know, give you exactly the wrong signals at the most dangerous time. When in the middle of a boom, uh, if you're just looking at market behavior, everything looks great. It looks like risk has declined tremendously. And so it's OK to lend more. And so it turns out, when you look at it, these very sophisticated looking models were very pro -sick. They also were based on the assumption of one firm at a time. And it turns out when many firms started following the same policy, that introduced a huge potential instability into the system, which we ended up seeing. So basically, both the financial industry and the regulators got caught up in a false mental model that the modern financial engineering and risk management, almost all of which was based on efficient markets, then, had basically conquered risk. Now, any good economist would have said, hey, that's not right. There really are some very genuine benefits of diversification and all that came out of a lot of it. But most of the people on Wall Street were mathematicians and physicists. So they took all these empirical correlations as fixed physical parameters. Whereas if you're an economist, you know that the correlations among different interest rates or stock prices all are going to vary a whole lot depending on the shocks. So that you shouldn't at all take <coughs> these as given. And we could tell way back from the Asian crisis in 1997-98 that these value at risk models that were essentially packed with looking wouldn't give you any kind of forecast of a crisis. Because they basically were very, very good for normal periods, but completely broke down in crisis. But yet being able to do great risk management in normal periods is sort of trivially important relative to avoiding crises or protecting yourself when they can. Two more uh, false mental models, and then we'll pray. Uh, the simplest one was one held by the general public and many regulators that housing prices never fall. Uh, I work, wondered for a long time, and I, and I bet some of you all have too, why did you get such a drop in standards in the market, mortgage value? Why did uh, you have all these liar loans? No, no documentation. Uh, it wasn't securitization. That's the popular answer. It was the particular way the securitization was done and the mortgages were written. A wonderful book uh, by Broughton called uh, Slapped by the Visible Hand. 
it goes through and weighs the same in detail. That all of these uh, things like adjustable rate mortgages, that was actually a good idea to give people the option of that. But it turned out in practice the adjustable rate mortgages weren't what economists thought. They were essentially very low interest rates for several years and then they jumped way up. Anybody you know, looking at that would say, hey, you're giving mortgages to a lot of people who won't be able to pay. Why did the lenders not worry about that? In part, because they figured if they had to foreclose, there would have been enough appreciation in the value of the collateral of the homes that it was no problem, that that would greatly exceed the cost of foreclosure. So that assumption was built in throughout the whole system into the ratings agents who way overrated uh, these things. Because again, we might say, well, the mortgage dealer wouldn't care because they could pass them on to the securitization. But then you have to ask, why would anybody be willing to buy these? And the answer was because they were rated AAA by the ratings agencies that used to have a pretty good reputation. Back on the bonds, they didn't do this so much. So you've got big structural changes in the market that put you into a very new situation. And it was really a version of this time it's different. The last aspect I mentioned uh, was a view uh, held very strongly by Ellen Greenspan that the market would be self regulated He thought that competition would be sufficient to induce firms to follow good policy. Adam Smith's invisible hand. And we know that in many, many areas that works, at least tolerably well. But traditionally, economists have said the financial sector is not one of those. There are various interdependencies <coughs> and all that make the financial sector special, especially the banking so that you can't rely just on competition. And Greenspan, I think because of ideology, just didn't believe that. He disliked government regulation. He thought correctly that it usually works bad. And so he assumed, uh, and I think he genuinely believed, I think this was not the lobbying from the banks, because he's, uh, my view is that actually Greenspan has very high personal integrity. I think he's done a lot of very, very costly things. But I think it's because he genuinely believed this. It wasn't that he was lobbied by the banks you know, so much. Uh, he really thought the system was going to be self policed And this spread throughout the regulatory community. Uh, a kind of argument that Greenspan or a lot of the regulators could make. Look, the big banks can pay three or four times as much as the regulators. They can hire much brighter people. They have much uh, more resources. They can do risk management much better than the regulators. So essentially, the way a lot of the Basel group went was to allow the banks to do internal mathematical models to set their risk and their capital. Now, there are a number of good regulators and people who work in government and the public sphere didn't do it for reasons other than money. But Greenspan's probably right that on average the risk managers in uh, uh, Citibank or Citigroup or, or those are, are going to be more capable have more, more capacity. But what that view completely missed was their incentives. They had strong incentives 
to game the system. And uh, Greenspan just did not realize. In many areas, it turned out in the financial sector. And I was sort of surprised to find this because I hadn't worked on these kind of issues until the crisis came along and got fascinated. That, you know, my first thought was, why didn't competition keep the banks from making all these risky loans? Well, it turned out competition induced them to make the risky loans. Because you also had a problem exacerbated by the modern risk management that you could tell the short run returns very clearly. You didn't have a good measure of the longer term risk. And so you went for the short term returns. And if, in fact, you had followed much more prudent policies, your short term returns would have been much less. And you would have lost business. So this is really there really is an analytic basis for that comment that Chuck Prince made that was so famous. That as long as the music is playing, you gotta keep dancing. That there really was a market structure of incentives where competition was not going to be sufficient. And you had to have regulation if you were going to stop that. And this was something that you get straightforward out of economics if you take it as a serious economic issue. But you miss if you take it as ideology or you for the market or against it. So what we end up seeing is, uh, was it bad performance of the market or bad performance of the regular? Answer is both A and B. It was very clearly both. And one of the somewhat scary <coughs> of a, the current discussions is certainly if we look at the U.S. Uh, financial market, we sort of correctly in a sense, I think, uh, saying there's got to be much more regulatory authority. But most of the financial crisis wasn't due to deregulation. Some of it was, but most of it was not. Most of it was non-enforcement of the regulations we had. So just having more regulations isn't going to do that. <coughs> We've got to worry very seriously about how to improve the structure of it. And just one simple thing on that is there's a very strong case for doing simpler rules that you know aren't ideal but aren't as easy to gain as these very sophisticated uh, systems. So a bottom line of that is be wary of too much sophistication because it can very often be used against you. Um, last comment, uh, how has the IMF been doing in the crisis? I would say on the whole pretty well. I've got particular criticisms I can mention if we go in. But it has done very good economic analysis where it uh, has been a very good communicator of mainstream economics. Now again, if you're a really strong new classical economist, you dislike the IMF because you say it's too Keynesian. If you're an extreme Keynesian economist, you dislike the IMF because it's too classic. And in fact, the IMF is right where it should be, in the middle of mainstream view. And on this, I think it's done a tremendously good job during crisis, and that's likely to increase its credibility for good bit. So I'll sort of end on that positive note about the IMF. Thank you.